Were you potty trained as a child? I'm banking that the answer is yes. I want you to imagine living life as an adult without having the basic ability to empty physical waste out of your body and know what is going on during that process. Now I'll ask you the same question, but I'll use the word emotionally potty trained. Were you taught a way to take in the environment, the waste that is coming into your body emotionally and have a safe, expressive way to actually release it so that you're not just holding and clinging onto it all your life. Again, imagine you weren't potty trained, no one taught you how to take a dump, how when your stomach hurts, it gurgles, you should go sit on the toilet, do your business, wipe, and then you can continue because you don't have that waste weighing you down inside. Imagine you didn't have that process and you're constantly walking around shitting on yourself, shitting on others, just releasing it all willy-nilly without understanding why it's happening. I promise if you stick through this entire video, you will have a clear understanding of what is going on with your emotions and how to actually release them and not keep so many of them stuck inside of you. Emotions are like a debt. Just like when you take on a thousand, ten thousand, fifty thousand, a million dollars in debt, it doesn't feel so good mentally. Emotions do the exact same thing. Each time you have an emotional experience and you don't address it and you don't adequately pay off the debt in the moment, it becomes stored in your body. Then later you'll have moments where, oh, this memory came up, this person, this thought. That's like a creditor calling you and saying, hey, Rad, you owe us $1,000. Oh, don't want to answer that right now. I'll go eat some ice cream. I'll go numb the emotions, numb the pain. They call back again 20 minutes later. It's $2,000 now. Hang up. Hey, it's $10,000. And then like 50 different creditors are calling you all the time, every minute. Those are your thoughts racing, your emotions coming through. You need a way to properly pay off that debt. So if you stick through this video, I'm going to be showing you how. The purpose of this episode is to help transform what you know, believe, feel, and therefore do when it comes to emotions. And those specific words are very important because information, just watching this video alone, isn't enough to cause transformation. We need action. My job is to give you enough philosophy, inspiration through stories, through telling and teaching, such that you take action on the things that I give you to do in order to improve your emotional self. So this is my agreement to you. I will do my absolute best to inspire you during the rest of this episode so that you take simple, straightforward, direct action and live a better life with less emotional burden. Now, emotions can be a charged word. So what this episode is not about is telling you to go cry, go get a therapist, go share all your feelings to all your friends. That is not what we're here for. We're not exploring your childhood, your traumas, your patterns. We're getting to the root cause of what emotions are in your body and how you can actually deal with them. We're here to let go of whatever needs to be released. We don't need to shame it, name it, guilt it. All these things that a lot of therapies usually do, it can work. We're getting right to the root and to the depth of it. Maybe you clicked on this video because you actually want to improve your emotions, or maybe you clicked on it because, hey, Rad made it, I just want to watch it. You really need to be clear and understand why emotions matter. Pretty much every single thing you do in your life is based on emotions. Whether you understand this yet or not, whether you believe you have mind over matter control, doesn't matter. I'm telling you, 95% of your life is emotional, unconscious-based actions. And I'm going to be proving that to you through this presentation. A simple example I think a lot of us can relate to, whether it's yourself or your friends, is you make this goal, this core value to lose 20 pounds. I'm going to eat healthier. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to do all these things to lose 20 pounds, right? Intellectually, great goal. I understand it's going to make me healthier. Then someone puts a burger in front of me, some ice cream, offers me chips, pizza. I eat it. And then later I realize, oh, why did I eat that? I, said, I wanted to lose 20 pounds, not gain an extra five. That is a straightforward, simple example of how your emotions tend to get the better of you. Even when you set clear, defined goals, objectives in your life, emotions, if you do not control them in a proper, adequate way, will take over and dictate how you live your life rather than living your life through core values. Keep this in mind. Successful people, no matter what industry, field, making money, relationships, doesn't matter what field they're in, do what they must do despite how they feel. And the inverse of that is that unsuccessful people rely on their emotions, motivation, inspiration. I got to feel the right moment, the right time, right energy in order to do something. And that is why they don't do it because they're susceptible to their emotions rather than learning how to work with, integrate, and allow the emotions to move through instead of controlling their lives. A lot of the time when I use the word emotions, people think about extreme emotions, anger, fear, depression, sadness, big showing outwardly emotions. However, 
the neglect and denial of your emotions is equally as bad as the other end of the spectrum. So we have two spectrums, one side explosive anger, one side complete denial of anger. For most of my life, I lived on the complete denial side. Yeah, of course I'm happy. I, I, have, I have enough money, I have a house, I have food, I have a good healthy body. How could I not be happy? I must be happy. I cannot be happy all the time. So accepting this was a huge part of my transformation and dealing with my irritable bowel syndrome. Okay, for those of you who know or don't know, I suffered with irritable bowel syndrome. It's basically a lot of severe digestive issues for a couple of years. And it was due to a lot of emotional stuff stuck inside of me because I was denying my emotions. So the things I'm teaching you here is how I pulled myself out of that emotional denial hole and equally well will work for those who have a hard time holding or controlling or not allowing their emotions to take the better of them during their daily lives. So I give credit to those who have taught me. I didn't come up with anything that I'm sharing with you here. So Michael Singer, The Untethered Soul, great, great resource. The Science of Enlightenment by Shin Zen Young. Two great books right there that if you read them over and over and over, will change your life. I guarantee it really changed and impacted my life. And then the practice of Vipassana meditation. So usually you would go away for 10 days, sit for 10 hours a day, no talking, no phones, no reading, no writing, no fun. You just sit and you meditate. I'm going to give you a abbreviated, more simplified version of this meditation that you can actually do at home. But if you're really interested in a strong emotional control and gaining it, this is like taking steroids, going to the gym, doing everything you can for 10 days to really strengthen your emotions, to really strengthen yourself. Highly recommend it. I'll leave a link in the description to find that out. Or you can check out this video as well. So we're going to cover a Chinese medicine approach to emotions mixed and fused with those resources I just gave you. We're going to talk about the root cause of suffering, and then I'm going to give you the three pillars of emotional mastery that I use, that I got from Shenzhen Young, to help you train yourself just like a professional boxer goes into the gym to train, to take a punch, to survive a fight. I'm going to teach you how to do that and make it instinctual inside of yourself so that when emotional situations arise, you're able to control yourself. According to Chinese medicine, stagnation is the cause of disease, and internal disease is caused by emotions. So when we have chronic emotions, we keep reliving past events, they become stuck inside of us energetically. And over time, that energy condenses, condenses, becomes a physical manifestation of a disease. Whether it's heart issues, kidney issues, liver, spleen, brain, there can be an emotional component and stagnated energy. Sometimes people have a hard time understanding energies, chakras, it's a bit esoteric. So Western medicine speak, we've got blood circulating through our veins and arteries, We've got synovial fluid, that is the fluid between the joints that nourishes the joint capsules. We've got cerebral spinal fluid moving through the spinal cord and the brain to help with the brain. We've got lymphatic fluid helping to circulate as well. When these fluids do not move, aka they stagnate from sitting too long, from not moving, from being congested and stuck, our organs, our tissues do not receive the nourishment they need and the waste removal they need. Over a chronic period of time, this destroys the body because our organs are not given adequate nutrition and waste removal to do their functions properly. Yeah, for a few days, not a big deal, a few weeks, a few months, but for years of constant stagnation, this problem arises. So as I talk about qi and blood flow in Chinese medicine, just think about the fluids in the Western medicine sense of the body. In Chinese medicine, there are no good or bad emotions, only excessive and prolonged emotions. When emotions are excessive and prolonged, they cause a stagnation in the energetic channel of the body. And over years of reliving, prolonging memories, thinking about into the future, into the past, our body stagnates, doesn't allow the proper flow of fluids, qi and blood to the organs, causing us to have problems. And in Chinese medicine, we have the five elements correlating to specific emotions, specific organs. If you know about Chinese medicine, I'm gonna be leaving some stuff out. I'm simplifying this for the layman. But we have this thing called the wood element, which is associated to the liver, and that is with the emotion of anger. So the liver and gallbladder are a system with organs and energy channels that move through the body that are responsible for certain things. When anger, stress, frustration, resentment, anger is typically the main one, stress, frustration, resentment, is a predominant emotion, in Chinese medicine, certain pathologies will appear, and then we basically diagnose based on those pathologies. But if you're someone that suffers with a lot of anger and stress, it can tax the liver, the liver channels, causing certain symptoms to come up. Then we have the water element, which is the bladder and kidneys. That is associated to the emotion of fear. Metal element is the lungs, large intestine, associated to sadness and grief. And we have 
earth element, which is spleen and stomach. That is overthinking, uh, worrying, always thinking too much. Then the fire element, which is associated to joy, and that is the heart, pericardium, small intestine, and triple burner, energizer, sanjo. It's actually got four organs in the fire element. And when you think of all these emotions, generally the quote-unquote negative emotions, and we prolong them, that causes a tension to occur into our body. That tension squeezes, constricts the flow, the cerebral spinal fluid, the synovial fluid, our blood, our lymphatic system. So we're constantly living in this stressed, sympathetic state. Go, go, go. It tightens and constricts the body. This stops healing from occurring, and emotions, again, chronically cause disease in Chinese medicine. Now, you might have heard of this before, but attachment is the root cause of suffering. Now, this is taught by the Buddha 2,500 years ago, kind of the foundational principle of Buddhism. Life is suffering. We're going to be all suffering. And what it boils down to is an attachment to desires, cravings, pleasures, and an avoidance or aversion to pain. So people tend to think that in order to be happy, I have to get more of what I want, my pleasures, my addictions, and make sure I get less of what I don't want. This is a fallacy that occurs, and we're going to dive deeper into how it forms and what you can do about it. People tend to think that if we can control what is outside of us, if my parents didn't call, my brother, my sister, my boss, all these different things, my work, my location, then I would have some inner peace. When reality is that inner peace comes from working through the heart, through the mind, such that whatever is going on outside of you isn't actually the cause of your problems and sufferings. It's this attachment or need to get the way you want it and to make sure you don't get it the way you don't want it. And the more you can remove that layer, deprogram that from your mind, the happier you'll actually be because you'll accept whatever is coming through in the present moment without an attachment and without needing to change the state of your body to chase pleasure and um, avoid pain. So what I'm suggesting to you is that 95% of your actions are actually unconscious and they're just programmed into your nervous system. But the basis is that your body and your mind are always reacting on an if this, then that. So based on previous experience, if this happens, then I do this. If this happens, then I do that. This is very needed. It's very valid. It helps to protect us, helps to organize the chaos that is around us. As a child, you come out into this world, you have no idea what this cup is, what this liquid is, what this phone is. And if you had to constantly relearn and be like, oh, I don't know anything around me, life would be very difficult to survive. So your body, your nervous system is always learning what is a threat, what is pleasurable, what is good, and it's creating these desires. In Western medicine, we would describe this through the principle called Head's Law. I'm going to read you the definition, and then I'll give you my simplified definition. Hebb's law is any two cells or systems of cells that are repeatedly active at the same time will tend to become associated so that activity in one facilitates activity in the other. Sounds kind of like mumbo jumbo, but the basis of it is that neurons that fire together wire together. That is the saying most oftenly taught. And so the idea is your brain has a bunch of neurons, okay, the cells of the brain, and it's kind of like a jungle in there. And so every action we take, habits, patterns, it's like an elephant walking through the jungle and beating a path. So the beaten path is to eat burgers, to yell, to have emotional incontrols, to wake up at a certain time. All these 95% unconscious actions that we're living through day to day that control and dictate our behaviors are just these pathways that were set in as a child and a teenager. In order to set new habits and new pathways, You've probably tried this before. I'm going to wake up at an earlier time. I'm going to exercise. And it's very difficult. Why? Because those neurons are not wired together yet. And your brain takes the path of least resistance, which is to follow down the elephant pathway rather than taking a machete, hacking through, making a new path. The crux and the benefit of what you're here to learn and do really boils down to this. In daily life, we have something called a stimulus and a reaction. Okay, stimulus, burger is put in front of me. I know burgers are good. I react and I eat it. Okay, stimulus, reaction. Stimulus, it's triggering me. I don't have much time, I react. My boss yells at me, my spouse comes home, something triggers me inside. There's very little time between the thing that's triggering me or stimulating me and the reaction that I give. So this is typically unconscious and immediate. What we want to work towards is stimulus and response. 
And the big difference between those two is the amount of time that occurs between the trigger, the stimulus, and the chosen action. So something pleasurable or unpleasurable strikes your senses moment to moment, whether it's a burger, whether it's a TV, it's a couch, laying in bed, your boss calling, your taxes, your mortgage, pleasurable, unpleasurable strikes you. Then it's your ability to witness the stimulation, the emotions that are arising inside of your body, pleasurable or unpleasurable, and then make a decision that's based on your core values and goals. I said I want to lose 20 pounds. I said I want to make a million dollars. I said I want to have a good relationship to my spouse, husband, wife, kids. I want to have a job that's fulfilling X, Y, Z, whatever your goals are. In order to follow those goals and be successful with them, we need to have good stimulus and response, not stimulus and reaction. If you keep having and living off of a stimulus reaction, you're going to keep getting whatever it is you're already getting in life. And so if you want to make that change fundamentally with emotions and everything in your life, we need to understand this. So I'm going to further break it down into something that I learned during the Vipassana practice through the Buddha 2,500 years ago. This is how your brain is working moment to moment to make every single decision and action and behavior in your life. So I call it four stages. So stage one is a sensory input. Okay, vision, hearing, smell, touch, taste, and thoughts and emotions. That is a sense in the Buddhist uh, practices. So in Western medicine, Western philosophy, we just have these five external senses. In the Buddhist philosophy, I'm not a Buddhist, by the way, there's also thinking and feeling that strikes the senses. So stage one, your consciousness is witnessing these states, uh, senses being struck, whether it's seeing the burger, whether it's smelling food, whether it's hearing someone's voice that triggers. So stage two is a recognition of this sense input. Because you were a child, baby, you grew up, teenagers, adult, you understand that when you put a tasty burger in your mouth, you feel good. So there's a recognition and association of conditioning to all the things around us. So I have a conditioning that this table, this microphone, this phone, it's not going to cause me harm, right? So this conditioning of so many different things that can cause me an emotional charge or most of the time is not going to cause me an emotional charge because there's no threat or danger. And the second part of this stage, after I recognize what this stimulus is, it's going to produce a sensation on my body inside that is pleasurable or unpleasurable. This sensation is super hard to feel. And that's part of the Vipassana practice. When you go away for 10 days and sit for 100 hours of meditation, you become more deeper and more deeper into your body to feel subtler and subtler sensations of reality. In stage three, which is usually not accessible to us, we have the unconscious or subconscious mind that is feeling all the sensations of the body, pleasurable or unpleasurable, moment to moment, all the time. Stage four, we have a reaction to this. So my body's feeling pleasurable, I react in a specific way. So to take you through that channel again, sense input, I see the burger, recognition, I've had burgers before, they're tasty, I like them, pleasurable sensations released in my body, subconscious mind, stage three, is feeling those pleasurable sensations, causing the reaction or the attachment, the craving, the desire, the addiction towards that specific thing. Now, burger examples, burger example, but everything around you moment to moment is striking your senses, having a recognition, creating a sensation or feeling that your subconscious mind is then creating reactions to all the time. And this is what leads to suffering in the Buddhist nature. We always have these desires of what I want my life to be, what I want the outcomes to be, to control. And then the things I don't want, I better make sure I don't get those. So I'm always thinking and processing and having emotions related to getting what I want, not getting what I don't want. And when this pattern stays unconscious, subconscious, deep down, without any practices to adjust or modify, life is very much a suffering fest with little moments of happiness and joy, a lot of moments where we're not getting what we want, things are not going the way we want to, all these external things outside of us that we can't control. What you can control is your mind, your emotions, how you feel. Now I'd like to address something called the three pillars, which is part of the training. I'm going to give you the philosophy, the understanding. I got this from Shin Zen Young, author of The Science of Enlightenment, a really, really powerful book, a meditation teacher, practitioner, and shared to me by a friend called Michael Holt. He's actually inspired a lot of emotional changes and the theory inside of me that's helped me progress. So the first pillar is something called equanimity. 
and I'll read you the uh, Oxford definition. Mental calmness, composure, and even temper, especially in a difficult situation. Now for me, I like to describe equanimity as non-reactivity to the good or bad. Without this, we tend to prolong our emotions. Something bad happened to me, I keep attaching, I keep reliving that negative thing, I can't let it go, I can't not react to it. Something good happens, okay, drugs, alcohol, rock and roll lifestyle, whatever your pleasures are and you keep chasing them, that is also an attachment and a need. You can see how both extremes are not good, right? If I'm chronically addicted to some sort of drug or person, relationship, power, money, I'm always chasing it, will never be enough, and I'll always live in the fear of losing it. Let's consider the world of sports when we talk about equanimity and non-reactivity. So we got a quarterback who's throwing the pass of the century, and it fumbles, starting to lose the game. Oh my God, it's the last quarter. I just messed up the throw. That professional quarterback now has the option, if he's trained it adequately, to be like, okay, that's in the past. I can let that go. I need to move on to the present moment right now so that I can win. A lesser athlete or person or human in any situation might just keep it like, oh, I missed that pass. I missed that last pass. How could I have missed? And then the game is happening. Life is happening to you right now as you're thinking about that last pass you missed. And then life continues to happen. The game keeps on going. And then another game keeps going. And you still think about that last pass that you messed up. And 20 passes go when you messed up. And 30 passes and like all these things that are happening. That is in Chinese medicine, the prolonging of those negative, quote unquote, negative emotions. So we need to build a practice of equanimity so that we can allow our emotions and our mind to be felt, to be let go of without attachment or need to cling on to it. When you realize that the only constant in life is change and that no matter what is happening, it will change and you accept that, then you can start to relieve some suffering and some emotion. But when you cling on to this idea that everything is permanent and it must be your way, you're not living with equanimity, you're not accepting the good or the bad without reacting, your stimulus response is a stimulus and a reaction and your quality of life degrades. So realize that whatever pain you're going through, it's not permanent, it will change, it will fluctuate. Whatever pleasure you're going through is not permanent, it's gonna fluctuate. You're always moving up and down through pain and pleasure. And the more you can keep that line centered, such that you have some pain, you have some pleasure. You have some, it's not going from, oh God, there's so much pain right now, I need to get pleasure in any way I can. Pleasure is gone, oh my God, now I have even deeper pain and deeper problems. Pain is actually super powerful and important. In the physical world, if I put my hand on a hot burning stove, Thank God I have pain receptors in my hand that will very quickly, but probably not quickly enough, tell me, hey, well, take your hand off that burning hot stove. This is going to cause you damage, right? On a physical plane, I could take numbing creams, gels, take Advil painkillers to allow me to put my hand on that hot stove for a longer duration, but that will not yield good results. We understand this on the physical plane. But when it comes to an emotional plane and our emotional hand is on that hot stove are we taking antidepressants numbing agents drugs whatever thing we can to avoid feeling that pain but realize that that pain is actually growing and amplifying and you need the signal to make a change in your life so let's go into emotions real quick if someone's experiencing depression and i mean depression where it's not some sort of very genetic neurochemical receptors problem I'm talking most people with depression, not the rare exception. If for me, I was to lay in bed all day, get up at 12 p.m., eat bad food, not exercise, not drink water, not have purpose in my life, just watch Netflix, eat ice cream, then my body as a pain signal is going to send me depression. All right. If I was doing all that stuff and my body sent me the signal of happiness, hey, this is great, keep doing it, which in the short term, in the beginning, is what it does. Signals dopamine, ice cream's great, staying in bed, being late, it's great. In the long run, not so great. So if my body didn't have this defense pain mechanism of sending me a strong emotion of depression, I would have no reason to change my habits. The body realizes this is not healthy, this is not actually helping me, I'm deteriorating my state. I need to send this guy Rad up here the signal that this is painful, just like a hand on a hot stove. Emotions can be painful. 
especially something like depression. You just sit there, you feel so empty inside. Going for a walk, exercising, taking care of yourself. That will improve your mood and make your body start to crave those things that are improving you. So in that sense, the emotion, it's very important. It's a pain response from the body to help you to take action. The more we numb and move away from that, the less action we can take. And the more negative actions we allow our body to keep building up. Another physical example of this is someone with heartburn. So they know that every time they eat spicy chicken wings, spicy food, processed food, they get heartburn, they get nausea, they get vomiting. And instead of listening to their body like, hey, every time I eat these foods that seem to have a negative response, instead of like, stop eating those foods, let me go to my doctor, let me get, take some antacids, some tablets. Hmm, I take these tablets, pain reduces, it might even go away. But now the signal that's saying, hey, don't eat these foods, is no longer coming. I can eat more of those foods more consistently, more frequently. And if I'm getting a pain response right away when that food is coming in, you bet that that food is doing more damage down the line, down the system. And now you've turned off this smoke alarm or detection system. So when it comes to your emotions, same thing is happening when we numb it. We use these tools that we learned as children. And I want to say that these tools are they're very valid. We need these tools. If we didn't have these tools, we'd have a very hard time navigating the amount of stress in the daily lives. However, these tools are not so sustainable in the prolonged period when it's drugs, alcohol, sleep, deprivation of many different pleasures or pains. So working through it with equanimity, first pillar, very, very important. When it comes to your physical body, you have a certain capacity for physical trauma. If I hit myself gently in the hand, no physical trauma. A little bit harder, a little bit harder, I'm starting to get some bruising. Someone hits me with a baseball bat or a car, I break my bones, I'm in a hospital. Physically, I have a certain amount based on my body type, based on my training, based on what is hitting me, I have a certain capacity to absorb trauma in the moment. Same thing happens emotionally. If you've trained your emotional body, your emotional mind, you can take a lot more quote unquote trauma in the moment so it's not becoming stored in the body, just like bruising, just like breaking a bone. And most of the time we have all this stored emotional trauma that has broken and twisted our emotional bones and they've healed in crooked ways, but no one can see it on the physical side. We can only feel it on the internal emotional side. So again, in Chinese medicine, prolonged or excessive emotion, that is too much trauma in the moment that my body's unable to handle and process, becomes stored, leading to chronic problems. So then begs the question, how do we start removing and releasing this stored stuff? Well, there's four ways to experience emotions. Really important to understand this. The first way to experience an emotion is something actually happens to you in the physical plane. Someone yells at you, someone cuts you off, you drop a glass of water on your foot, you generate that emotion in the present moment. Then there's attunement where somebody else's emotion influences your emotional state. You go to a funeral, everyone's sad, you probably start to feel sad. You go to a party, everyone's happy, you start to feel happy. Number three is to think your way into emotion. So forwardly thinking, uh, projecting into the future, some sort of positive or negative thing happening reliving past experiences, positive anything happening. Nothing's actually happening to you physically in the moment to stimulate that emotion, but yet it's arising. And then the fourth way, which is probably the most important way for you to understand, once I learned it, I was like, oh, I can release the shame and guilt of having emotions and accepting that I have emotions, is that we have this somatic release of emotions that are stored in our tissues. So you might notice when you go for a run, feel good, it's releasing some things. We do a yoga class, breath work, qigong, acupuncture, get a massage. Pressing on the body releases stored energies or emotions, and then they arise up. When we suppress that, I like to think of it like an enema. So a physical enema, that's when water goes up your butt, you hold it for a few minutes, you go to the toilet, cleans out the colon. Same thing with emotions. When we do a practice, especially something like medical qigong that works on a specific emotion, that practice stimulates and releases a lot. And then you need to sit through that release in order to release. It sounds a little weird, but imagine I give you a physical enema, water up the butt, and then I don't tell you, hey, you're gonna need to go to the toilet and you have no potty training. And you start walking around everywhere and like your stomach's hurting, you're like, oh my God, what is happening? My body feels terrible. That's what happens a lot of the time when you do these practices emotionally, things get stirred up and don't have the proper tool or mindset to deal with what is coming through. So with the three pillars and the practice I'm going to show you, that is what we're building towards.
But when you don't understand how these emotions arise in experience, you tend to cling on to shame. Oh, this thing in my life, life is going so good. Why do I feel so bad? It's stuff that's been stuck in for you for 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years that needs to come out and be released. It's nothing to do with what your life is right now. You might have a perfectly fine life, but this is old crap that needs to be let go of. And if you keep thinking and clinging, I'm a happy person. I shouldn't be feeling this. Why am I feeling this shame, guilt, judgment of ourselves and our emotions? Then we don't allow this release process to occur, especially when you're doing an external modality that enemas you. You need to be able to release it with equanimity, with non-attachment. Oh, this is so painful. Oh. Okay, but I can just watch the pain. I don't have to react to it. And in watching it, then it becomes released. See, when you have an emotional storage of trauma or energy, it's stored with pain. So when that debt creditor calls, hey, you owe me a thousand bucks, you owe me 10,000, 20,000, that's emotional pain coming up with that debt. If you choose to numb it, transmute it, shift it, change it, ignore it, it doesn't go away. It just keeps building up. The only way to release stored emotions and gain control over yourself is to be willing to sit with the pain that comes with the release. So we have the three pillars. First one, equanimity, non-reactivity to good or bad. Second pillar is sense clarity. This is what allows you to feel the pain, to feel into your body, and to live in the present moment. So sense clarity is basically how well are you connecting to the present moment of what you see, what you hear, what you feel, what you smell, what you taste. So literally the sensations of my shirt on my body, my feet on the floor, my butt in this chair, the heat in this room, the sweat. When I bring sense clarity to my body and I start to feel all those things, that actually brings me into the present moment. And in order to release pain, I need to feel it. I need to sit through these emotions and feel them. And the only way to really successfully do that is with equanimity. Otherwise, you're just feeding into it. You're numbing, you're elevating, you're creating new addictions, new attachments, new aversions. When you meet it with equanimity, these old patterns in your brain and in your body start to become released. They no longer hold the same power that they used to. And the third pillar is concentration. That is your ability to concentrate on what you deem is important. And so if emotional release and practice and good communication, making money, improving a skill, living a healthy, happy life is important to you, bringing concentration to your senses is super important. Okay, I remember I told you, we got sense input, we have a recognition of that sense, a subtle sensation inside of our body, and then a reaction. The more concentration we can bring inwards to our body, what we're feeling, aka putting ourselves in the present moment, and meeting it with equanimity, not reacting to all the stimulus that's around us, but instead responding with a way that's congruent to our goals, our core values, our dreams, we will become more successful in emotions and in many different fields. So just like a boxer who goes to fight professionally, if you were to show up to a professional fight or some random mugger or person in the bar or whoever started to fight you and you never practice fighting and they're way bigger than you, do you think you're going to win? Probably not. And you're going to leave battered. You're going to have panic. And so on a physical plane, fighting, yes, that is what's happening with your emotions on a daily basis. You are the weak, pathetic, underweight fighter going against Goliath who's been training his entire life to pummel the crap out of you. So we need a practice to help develop your sense of emotional control, concentration, clarity, and equanimity. And the best way I know how to do that is through a modified variation of Vipassana. So this isn't Vipassana itself, it's, it's modified. Okay, when you go to actually do a Vipassana, this is not what we're doing. But it will still help build all those powers. But it will still help build all the three pillars that are fundamental to emotional control and living a good life. So the main idea of the practice is you're going to find a comfortable position to sit in with your spine erect and tall in a good posture, whether that's cross-legged on the floor, if you're going to be on the floor, it's ideal if you have a pillow under your butt so that your hips are elevated above your knees. Um, sitting in a chair, totally acceptable. What is not good is laying down or having your back resting against something. You need to be active, alert, and awake. You'd be surprised some of the positions I've seen people fall asleep when they're meditating. Sitting with tall posture makes it a lot harder to fall asleep. You're concentrating. It keeps you in your body. It doesn't let the mind float away as much, so very important. Once you've found a position... You're going to set a timer, 5, 10, 15 minutes, and you're going to 
not move anything, all right? Pain is going to start arising. Discomfort is going to start arising. And the purpose of this practice is to change your relationship to pain and discomfort, as well as pleasure, but I won't get into that in this uh, episode. But when you sit and you don't move, the mind gets irritated, it gets bored, it starts sending scratching, itching sensations, it wants to move, you start getting numbness in your legs, your knee starts hurting, your back starts hurting, your neck starts, all these emotions are arising and you wanna do something else to stimulate yourself. So this is just like the boxer going into the gym, hitting the bag, working the pads, doing push-ups, doing squats, to build up your emotional capacity to absorb trauma in the moment. And as you do that, you start to release old trauma. And while you're doing this, not moving, you're gonna be focusing on your nose and your breath. There's many different ways to manipulate and focus and work on concentration. So I'm gonna give you the easiest one I know because I like to use objective things rather than here, sit for 20 minutes and focus on your breath. For most people, 19 of those minutes are gonna be spent thinking about something else and it's kind of a waste of time to do that. So what you're better off doing is setting an alarm for 30 seconds, for a minute, and these are kind of contradictory because part of the practice is to sit and not move for five, 10, 15 minutes, okay? That is building one aspect, that's building your equanimity, but we also wanna control the mind, okay? build concentration so that we're focusing on a task we deem important rather than letting the mind float away to something else. So one part of the meditation, a task, depending on how good you are, quote unquote, how good you are, uh, it's a skill, just like riding a bike, just like boxing, it takes time. When you can combine both, amazing. In the beginning, probably, you're still trying to do both, but it's gonna need to be separated because you need to build concentration on its own through very objective measures. So objective means setting an alarm for 30 seconds. You're still not moving, but it's gonna be 30 seconds. And you focus on, Breathing through the nose, okay, the sensations coming in and out. This is one idea. This is the Vipassana way. Or an easier one, more measurable, more objective, is to pick a number. Let's say 20. So in 30 seconds, I'm going to count down from 20, 19, 18, 17 to 0. Two ways to succeed. I either hit 20 to 0, and I know it. Hey, I counted every number. For sure, I did it. Great. The other way is to, hey, the 30 second marker went off. And the 30 second marker is what keeps you honest. It keeps you objective. Because let's say I get from 20, 19, 18, my boss, my work, I forgot to do the laundry. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, fuck. Okay, I, I lost count somewhere. Reset the 30 second timer. Clearly, my concentration skills might not even be enough to use 30 seconds. I might need to go down to 10. A 10 second timer, focus the mind on one object, whether it's your breath whether it's counting down from a specific number. And just like going to the gym, showing up, doing more reps every time you come, every day you either add another five seconds, another 10 seconds to the timer that keeps you honest. So let's say in the beginning, you could only do 30 seconds, then you go up to a minute, then two minutes, then five minutes. And in that five minutes, you're counting down, let's say from 100, from 200, and you're testing yourself objectively. Can I stay focused on the task of counting and with 100% certainty, know which number I'm on. Anytime you fail to know what number you're on, reset the timer, reset the count, start again. You gotta train your brain to concentrate on what you want. This is very important because it's difficult to do that when you're just sitting and meditating. It's very difficult to do it in a situation where your spouse, your partner, your parents, your kid is yelling at you and you're reacting and Rad said, okay, well, I need to not react. How do I do that? Concentrate, feel what I'm feeling, and apply equanimity to it. So we gotta train that in a safe space that's predictable, five, 10, 15, 20 minutes a day. And that is the main practice that unites what we're doing here. Putting it down on paper, it's actually a really simple practice to put together everything I just talked about. Sit down, five, 10, 20 minutes, okay? Start off small. If you've never done this before, don't commit to a 30 minute meditation say Your mind is gonna be all over the place. Your body's gonna to wanna to move. For inspiration, okay? I've seen 60 and 7 year old, 70 year old dudes in Vipassana sitting for 10 hours a day straight for 10 days in a row. If you're doing 10 minutes and your mind and body are saying, this is excruciating, I have to move, you probably do not have to move, okay? That is your inability to deal with pain and discomfort. 
course, if you have sharp, stabbing, shooting pain, it's not about torturing yourself. For 10 minutes, I'm probably going to be fine, okay? Whatever pain is arising. So now we're training the subconscious, unconscious mind to be okay with whatever pain, physical discomfort, emotion is arising up in my body and to just observe it. That is a huge part of the practice. Noticing that it's changing, we're shifting, we're feeling more angry, we're feeling more fearful. Well, now it's a little bit less fear, and it's a little bit less anger. I've got this knee pain, this back pain, that's really excruciating, but you know now it's not as excruciating as it was 10 seconds ago. And now it's really excruciating, now it's not. So we're building this awareness that sensations in our body are always changing. We don't need to react to them. The only way you're going to do this is by actually sitting and doing the practice. It's great to theorize, to tell you, yeah, don't react. Be okay with pain. Be okay with discomfort. But unless you actually train that into your body, it's like giving you books to read about boxing or riding a bike or swimming. You can have all this theoretical knowledge about how to do it, but until you do it and practice it, it's not developed as a real skill. It's just mental masturbation. So I invite you now to practice this with me. We're going to do a five-minute sit. You're going to get a comfortable spot. I'm going to put the camera on me. And we're going to do this practice. So if you're serious about actually improving yourself, getting your goals, your emotions, do this practice with me right now. If you click off on this episode, go do something else, I guarantee you're going to forget about it. So actually write this down on a piece of paper, post a note, set an alarm. We're going to do five minutes, and I'll start guiding you through the practice now. Find yourself a comfortable position, whether it's on a bed, a couch, feet crossed, down, chair, whatever it is. We're going to pick that position. I'm going to hold and not move for five minutes. Feel free to close your eyes, and I'll guide you through this. You're going to have a tall posture, relaxing the body. And do your best right now to just focus on your nose with a sensation of air coming in and out. We're not trying to manipulate or change the breath, so if the breath is deep, let it be deep. If it's shallow, let it be shallow. We're trying to learn to accept anything that's coming into the moment. Any sensations that arise on the body that make you want to move, to scratch. Just observe, notice it changing. And when the mind starts to wander, you notice it's left the path. Bring it back to the nose, to breathing. Don't become upset as the mind wanders. That is not being in equanimity. Accepting that it wanders and then bringing it back to the task. That is the goal. Whatever disturbance may be arising, whether it's mental thoughts, emotions, physical pain or discomfort, your only job is to allow them to pass through, to witness them without reacting, to focus the mind back on the breath.
this simple practice will change your life if you commit to doing it daily. You're reprogramming your subconscious, your unconscious mind, changing the relationship to pain and discomfort such that you don't react, you don't run away, you don't numb. But instead, you allow yourself to fully feel it without attaching to it. And that is what allows it to be released. Good work in this meditation practice. If this is something you enjoyed, I don't usually do this at the end of my episodes. If it is, leave me a comment. Let me know that this is something you want. I can make more content around it. I currently only do it in my Gucci gang, my inner circle. We meet once a week, 9 a.m. Saturday, Toronto time, New York time. We do moving physical practices get the emotions stirred up, and then we'll sit in anywhere from 7 to 10 minutes in this type of meditation to help build everything we talked about in this. So if you're interested in that, there's a link down below. If you're interested in more meditation practices like this, let me know, and I'll make more content around you. Let me know, and I'll make more content around it. Thank you for sticking through all the way. Make sure to like, subscribe, follow, and I'll see you in the next one.